we've been examining uh, statements and phrases that Jesus makes in the last week he was alive. Obviously, today is resurrection. We're still going to study and look at one of those phrases that he makes before the cross, and we're also going to connect that to the resurrection. So the hope today is as we study Scripture, we find out that Jesus was looking beyond the cross. He wasn't looking at the cross. He was looking through it. He was looking beyond it to something else, something bold, something incredible, and that is a promise for you, and it's a promise for me. So, Today, we're going to dig into Scripture. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 26 and Luke chapter 22. I'm also going to reference a couple other Scriptures uh, in Revelation and a couple other different places. But Luke 22, Matthew chapter 26, uh, before we dig into Scripture, I, I just want to take time to welcome the presence of God again in this place and wherever you might happen to be virtually. So God, we welcome you. We welcome you. I welcome you into every single place. You are welcome, God. This is your kingdom. It's all about you. God, as we study your scriptures, as we look to your word, God, we want to enter into the gates of your kingdom. We want to come into that place of presence. God, we want to notice you. God, that we want to read more than just the words on the page. We want to hear the heart of the king. So, Holy Spirit, you are welcome into every location that is, that is listening to this message right now, whether it's here in person or whether it's virtual and online. You are welcome. And so, God, we pray, I pray for every heart, every, every person who's listening, that you would open our ears to hear. God, I, it doesn't matter what I say. It matters what you say. And so, God, we want to hear what you, want to, what you have to say to us by your Holy Spirit. Open our minds to understand and really grasp the power of the resurrection, God, and open our hearts to just dare to believe today. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So I'm going to set the scene from where we're taking our, our phrase that Jesus has made. Um, so the place, the setting, is the Last Supper. Uh, many of you are very familiar with The Last Supper. You've maybe seen Leonardo da Vinci's painting of The Last Supper uh, and seen his, you're very familiar with that, that picture. It's a very popular picture. Why they all sit on one side of the table is because Leo had to paint them. Uh, they didn't sit around the table. They all sat on one side. Jesus came into the restaurant, says, I need seating for 24. And he says, wait a minute, we didn't have that reservation. Well, I only need 12 seats, right? Um, bad joke. I get it. Uh, but we're really feel familiar with this painting, and we're all familiar, many of us are very familiar with the actual Last Supper itself. Some of us have read the account, some of us have heard the account preached, some of us heard the account preached millions of times, right? But Jesus makes a statement in that, in, that, in the middle of that, Jesus gives us communion. He gives, he breaks the bread, he says, this is my body, he gives us the cup, says, this is the blood of my new covenant, uh, and he does this, and, and it's right in the middle of that that, um, that they're celebrating, and Jesus gives his famous last statement, okay? And so Jesus knows at this point in time, as he's celebrating the Passover feast with his disciples, Jesus knows how close things are. He is living, literally living in the shadow of the cross. The cross is looming. By the time Jesus says this statement, he knows beyond a shadow of a doubt within 24 hours he will be dead. Dead. And he gives this statement. Okay? Our statement comes from two places in Scripture. The first one is in Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 18. When the hour came, he, being Jesus, reclined at the table and the apostles with them, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I shall not eat it again until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken the cup and given thanks, he said, take this and share it amongst yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. Now, if you are, uh, I, I want you to really focus in on two uh, two words, or one word that's repeated twice, until, until, right? The second statement is like it. It comes from Matthew chapter 6, verse 29. I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of this vine from now on until that day when I drink it with you, new in my Father's kingdom. So the idea behind our statement 
is this. I'm not going to take part in this celebration again until the full meaning of the celebration is totally fulfilled and until I can do it again with you. It's a powerful word, until. In Luke's gospel, it's recorded that Jesus um, says that twice. And if Jesus says it twice, we probably should take notice of it. Okay? And so let's take some time to break down the idea behind this statement to really understand what Jesus is saying and what it means for us. Okay? The first thing, Jesus has plans beyond the cross. Jesus has plans beyond the cross. Jesus says, I am not doing this again until. What does that word mean? It means there's an expiration date on what Jesus just says. I'm not doing this again, but there's an expiration date on that statement. I am not going to celebrate this again until everything is fulfilled. When everything is fulfilled, that statement expires and we're going to do this again. Right? And so sometimes Jesus is expecting to celebrate this feast again sometime in the future. And on the other hand, you have the cross. On one hand, you have his statement that says, I'm going to do this again. And on the other hand, you have the cross. Jesus is living in the shadow of the cross. We've already talked about that. It's, it, it, right now, the shadow of the cross is looming over Jesus. And he knows he goes to the garden. He says, Father, if there be any other way, let this cup of suffering pass from me. Jesus knows. He knows what's going to happen. He knows what's going on. Yet he still says, until. Until. Look, the cross is not the failure of Jesus' mission. It is the fixed will of God. It just, it, the cross is Jesus' deliberate choice and by going to the cross, the cross may be indirectly in Jesus' pathway, but Jesus is looking to the plans that he has made beyond the cross. Hebrews tells us for, for, the joy of the, for the joy that he was looking forward to, Jesus bore the cross and sh suffered the shame of the cross so that he might, come on, it goes beyond the cross. The cross is not the end for Jesus. This is not a failure. The cross is not the failure of Jesus. A lot of people will look at the cross and say, but Jesus died. He failed. The cross was not the failure of Jesus. That was a step along the pathway, and it was uh, Jesus was looking through the cross to the plans he had made beyond the cross because the cross was God's fixed will and Jesus' direct obedience. And then on the other side of the cross, Jesus has the joy. Right? Jesus has the joy. The, the, the cross, Jesus has plans beyond the cross. Second point. The plans Jesus has includes total fulfillment of this celebration. Let's pause and time out and understand what we're talking about here. Jesus is celebrating the Passover. There are three really big feasts that, that Hebrews, the Israelite people, will celebrate uh, on a yearly basis. They will celebrate the Passover, which is this one, where they celebrate uh, the exodus from Egypt. They will remember the exodus from Egypt. Uh, they celebrate the Feast of Weeks, which is, uh, we call it Pentecost. Um, but on that day, what that celebration is all about is the day they came to Mount Sinai and God gave them the law. It's a major celebration for the Hebrew people. And the third one is the Feast of Booths, where they remember how they wandered in the desert uh, for 40 years, and they celebrate that God was leading them, even though they were kind of not necessarily... What got them into that position was not necessarily a good thing, but they were still following what God is, how God was leading in that time. So three major celebrations, and Jesus is celebrating the Passover. He says, I am not going to celebrate this again until the whole thing, the whole idea of Passover has come to its total and complete fulfillment. That must have been a shocker for a lot of Hebrew people, for, for, the, for his 12 disciples sitting around the table. He's like, what do you mean the whole thing? You know, maybe it, maybe it was a statement that went over their heads. Like, we know, we understand the whole thing. There was Egypt and the Exodus and Moses and the Ten Plagues and... Um, and, and the Red Sea, and the wilderness, and the manna, and the quail, and the water from the rock, and I can keep going. 
You know, there was the voice of God, the Ten Commandments. We can keep going. But they're, they're celebrating and they're remembering this, this Passover feast is all about that. Um, and so they had this celebration every year to remember and to celebrate God's power in releasing Israel from the oppression of slavery to Egypt. It's very focused, right? And so now Jesus hints that the full meaning of the celebration is somehow incomplete. I will not eat this with you. I will not eat of this again until it has come to its full fulfillment, total fulfillment, right? So let's look at it. There are four sections in Passover. In the Passover, there's four specific cups of wine that indicate four specific sections of the celebration, right? So the first section of Passover, it causes people to reflect, it causes the Hebrew people to reflect on how oppressive and bitter their life was in slavery in Egypt. Think about that for a second. Now, none of us has ever been a slave, uh, but I'm imagining most all of us have had a job. Uh, and that's about as close as we'll ever get to slavery. Uh, unfortunately, we, uh, we fortunately get paid for it, uh, and we get to go home at the end of every night. But how many of you have ever had a job where you felt kind of like a slave? Okay? You understand what? We can't even begin to imagine the oppression of slavery. Okay? We can't even begin to imagine how wrong it was to tell an entire people group, no, we're better than you. We can't even begin to imagine the difficulty in God made every person with the image, in the image of God and to say one group of people that they are less than because of a racial thing, a nationality, a color of their skin, the fact that they were Egyptian and the Hebrew people were not, right? Any, it doesn't matter what you do, and I know I'm getting kind of a little bit off base, but this kind of thing needs to be said every so often in church. It doesn't matter what your skin color is. It doesn't matter what your background is. It doesn't matter what you come from. It doesn't matter your history, your financial status, whatever, your marriage status, your relationship status, what you've done in your past. You bear the imprint of God. Jesus loves you. And you are equal in my eyes, in the eyes of God. Okay? But Jesus, I mean, excuse me, not, not Jesus, Passover, the first section celebrated that it reminded, they had to put themselves back in that mindset of we are oppressed, we are pushed down, we have no hope, it's bleak, it's dark. God, if you don't do something, we are going to die here. Okay? And, and it ends with this cup representing God's promise to free them from slavery. The cup says... I will make you free. I will end your slavery. Okay? The second section reflects on how God promised to separate them from the place of their oppression. It's one thing to be free. It's another thing to be stuck, stuck as a free person in the land of your oppression. Right? You can be free. I mean, just think about it. Israel, God says fine, you're no longer slaves. And by his miraculous powers and mighty works, he, the, the Egyptian people say, we're not going to enslave you. We're not going to force you into labor anymore. You're, you're free. Have your way, but don't leave. Can you imagine waking up every morning, looking out your window and seeing the people that used to oppress you? How many generations would it take for that to get healed? Right? And how often would that other the other group of people look at them and look down at them for whatever, for whatever purpose, whatever reason. And this second section says, I'm not just going to make you free. I will bring you out. I will bring you out of that place of oppression, and I will give you a land of your own. I will give you a space. I made a promise to your forefathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that there would be a promised land that you would inhabit. I'm not just going to make you free and then leave you in that place. I'm going to make you free and bring you out to a place of your own. Okay? That's the second section. The third section reflects on how God changed their identity from slaves to be his special people. They, uh, they came out of Egypt as a group of slaves. And over the course of time as they walked before they walked into the promised land, God turned them into a nation. A nation of people. 
unified, allied, aligned under God. When they went to battle, they went to battle as one, not as a bunch of slaves. They went to battle as the nation of Israel, as the Hebrew people, right? When they moved in the desert, they moved as one, as the Hebrew people. They had their own set of rules. They had their own set of laws. They had their own moral code they, that governed everything that they did. They came out as a ragtag group of people that had a, a, a common link basically because of their ancestry. And by the time they're walking into the promised land, the people know them as the nation of Israel. You follow? And so the third cup, it, the third section ends with a cup representing a full promise Uh, the promise of a full transformation of their identity. And the fourth section, it's a little different. The first three sections reflect back on the oppression of, of the slavery, on the promise of God to bring them out. The third cup remembers their unity as a nation. The fourth cup looks forward. It doesn't look back. It looks forward. God makes a promise. Okay, that fourth cup is a little different speaks of a future time of a fully established nation where God is ruling as king, and it ends with a cup representing God's promise to establish himself as the eternal king over all of Israel. And Jesus establishes God as the eternal king who never dies, in seated, seated on the throne over all of Israel, ruling and reigning and giving the Israelite people prominence among the peoples of the earth. It's a promise of looking forward saying there will come a day there will come a time where there is one king one god one ruler one nation over all and that's going to be me and i'm jesus god says i'm in the, in the passover seder they celebrate this we are waiting for that day to come and Jesus says, I'm not going to drink of this. Or I'm not going to ha- celebrate Passover again until it has come to its full fulfillment, right? So Jesus says uh, that, but it hints, again, at plans beyond the cross. Plans beyond the cross. No one gets off a cross alive, yet Jesus has plans on the backside. Jesus has plans beyond it, right? But it also should tell us that what Jesus is about to do relates directly to this celebration. The first cup says, I'm going to free you from your oppression. What is your oppression? You are not enslaved. Here in America, we are not enslaved, but everyone is a slave to sin. Everyone is oppressed by sin. Matter of fact, when the angel shows up to Mary and says, he will be great, he will be called the son of the most high, Isaiah says, the government be, will be on his shoulders. Of his rule and reign, there will be no end. And, and the angel tells Mary, you will give him the name Jesus because he will save people from their sin. And Jesus says, the first cup, you've been oppressed, you've been oppressed by sin, you're still oppressed by sin. I'm going to free you. The second cup, which is where um, he breaks the bread and he gives uh, them uh, the bread of communion. The second cup says, I will bring you out. Jesus doesn't leave us in a place of sin. He brings us into a family. He brings us into a kingdom. He brings us and causes us to be. He changes our name, gives us a new identity. You aren't who you once were. You are bought and paid for. You've been given a new name. You've been given a new identity. You are a child of God. You're part of his kingdom. He's not left you free in your place of your oppression. He has brought you out into a new land. The third cup. The third cup. Jesus says, I'm going to give you a new identity and a new family. I kind of merged both of them, the, the second and the third one. The second one was, I'll bring you into the king of, kingdom of God. third one is, I'm going to give you a new identity. And all of this happens because of the cross. Every little bit of it happens because of the cross. But you know, it was after the third cup that Jesus says, I'm not doing this again until the fourth cup has come to its fullness. 
I will not drink this again until the kingdom of God is firmly established, until the kingdom is arrived over and one God, one Lord, one king, one people, one nation over all the earth. I will not drink this again until. Until. Third point. The plan Jesus has includes you. Matthew's gospel says, I will not drink this cup again until I drink it new with you. With you. This isn't just a celebration of Jesus. This is a celebration of everyone. This is the biggest party in heaven. The heavens got a shindig planned like you can't even imagine, right? And it's going to be a party atmosphere, and everybody's going to be celebrating one king, one lord, one god, one nation, one kingdom overall. The curse being reversed, that this nation of God, the the kingdom of God has been established and has overridden all the laws of man and all the rules of man, and God's perfection is there. And it's a party like you can't believe, and you are welcome to be part of it. See, every single follower of God is invited into his kingdom and into this celebration. Look at Revelation chapter 7, or excuse me, chapter 19, starting at verse 7. This is kind of the envisioning of that party. It says, let's rejoice and be glad. These are the hosts of heaven saying this. Let's rejoice and be glad and give glory to him because the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has prepared herself and has given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. And then he, the angel, said to me, John, write, Blessed are those who are inviting to the wedding feast of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Come on. These are the true words of God. Blessed are those who are invited. Who's invited? You are. Who's invited? You are. Everybody is invited, but will you accept the invitation? Everybody is invited to come out of a place of bondage to sin. Everybody's invited to be a part of the kingdom of God. But will you accept the invitation to be at the marriage supper? Will you be there? I, okay, look, I kind of imagine, I, 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 I don't know what it's going to be like. I, scripture doesn't tell us. But can you imagine the sheer vast numbers of people at this party in heaven. I imagine there's probably food because any good party has food, right? Um, I imagine there's probably food. Then in the middle of it, Jesus holds a Passover Seder and he says, hey, I'm 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 gonna free you from your oppression of sin. And we're all like, yeah! Second cup, I'm gonna bring you out, yeah! Third cup, I'll make you my people, woohoo! fourth cup, I will establish my kingdom and all of heaven, the foundation of heaven shakes because of the celebration. See, Jesus, the shadow of the cross may have been looming over Jesus, but that didn't stop him from imagining and walking forward because it says, this thing is not going to stop me. I'm going through it because I have plans on the other side, and guess what? You're coming with me if you choose to. If you choose to. He openly invites you to be part of the kingdom moving forward. See, the crazy thing, today is Easter. Today we celebrate the tomb being opened and a risen king walking out of that tomb. After Friday, he was, he was dead. He was marred more than any other man. Beyond the cross, is come, you know, Friday happened, yes, but today is Sunday, right? And the resurrection is the promise that makes all of this possible. I want to just read one account for you. Matthew chapter 28, now after the Sabbath, as it began to dawn towards the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to the tomb. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone, and he sat upon it. 
and his appearance was like lightning, and his clothes as white as snow. The guards shook from fear and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for the Jesus, for Jesus who has been crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he was lying, and go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And behold, he's going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, behold, I have told you. And they left the tomb quickly with fear and great joy, go figure, and ran to report to his disciples. And behold, oh, I love this. Jesus met, with, met them and said, rejoice. Party. And they came and took hold of his feet and worshiped him. Then Jesus said to him, do not be afraid. Go, bring my word to my brothers to leave for Galilee, and there they will see me. I can only imagine that moment. A detachment of soldiers standing in front of a sealed tomb bearing Rome's, signal, uh, Rome's seal and Pilate's insignia. And an angel descends from heaven. Maybe like, like just drops out like a, out of the sky like a superhero. Poof, you know. <laughs> and the ground shakes. And light, like lightning, gives off. And these guards have no answer for any of this. So they just play dead. And the angel walks up to the tomb, sees all the ceiling and the wrapping and the insignia, and it means nothing to him. And he just kind of slaps the stone to the side, and away it rolls. And he just props himself up on it and sits down, watching over the entire scene. And here come these women. Here come these ladies. Who's going to roll the stone away? And the angel says, why? And Luke's gospel says, why do you look for the living in the place of the dead? He is not here. He is risen. The resurrection makes it possible why would we celebrate a king if he's dead? Why would we have a celebration for his enthronement in heaven if he's dead? He is not dead. He is alive. And he sits at the right hand of the Father interceding for you and for me. And he invites every single person to join him in his life. I will bring you out of your slavery. I will bring you out of your oppression. I will bring you into the kingdom of God. And I will create a kingdom that will never end. Come with me. It's the resurrection that makes it possible. Because, we, because Jesus lives, we know death isn't the end for us. Jesus said it himself. John chapter 11. Jesus said to her, he's talking to Lazarus' sister, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, look at this, even if his physical earth suit, his or her physical earth suit wears out, even if they die. And everyone who listens to me will never die. And then he says this, do you believe it? He's posting the same question to you today. Do you believe it? Even though the physical earth suit may die. There's a spirit inside of you that is eternal. And even though the physicality wears out, if, if, if time keeps marching forward before Jesus steps in, this earth suit that I have will die. But my soul will not. And I believe that I will not die the visage of myself in this reality may, but I'll walk through the doorway from this life into the next life, and I'll be able to celebrate with my king at his coronation. Because he lives, I also live. Just like Jesus made plans beyond the cross, you should too. You should too. Don't get so locked down with all the oppression in this life. Jesus had a cross looming over him. You don't have that. But live. Don't live like this life is the end. Live like eternity stands before you. 
Live for something beyond the doorway and the pathway of death. Live for a resurrection that is coming. We should live our lives now not in the light of what might happen tomorrow, but in the light of what we're planning for in eternity. Stand with me, will you please? I love preaching messages like this because they're fun. They're exciting. It gives us opportunity to, and reason to celebrate. But we can't fast forward to the celebration without having a time of reflection for ourselves. A message like this calls us to self-examination. You, me, those of you out in virtual YouTube world. So let me just ask you this. Jesus says that he offers life. And Jesus says he offers a kind of life that you can't have without him. And Jesus made it possible for you to receive this life. So my question is, are you living this life, this temporary life, without hope for a future? Are you living this life without hope? Or are you living this life in a way that is planning to be part of the fulfillment of this full promise where Jesus says, I will not drink of the cup of the, this cup again until. Are you waiting for the until? Are you looking forward to the until? I may die. but I'm looking forward to the day where the expiration date is on Jesus' statement and I can celebrate with him in his kingdom. Father, I've done what you've asked me to do. I've said what you've asked me to say. Now, Holy Spirit, I pray that you do what only you can do. Holy Spirit, this is, a, this is awesome to sit and reflect on that this life is not the end. That, God, should you linger in setting up your kingdom, we will all face the reality in the doorway of death. Because the curse in this life, in this world, in this reality is a real thing. But in your kingdom, there is no curse. In your kingdom, there is no death. In your kingdom, there is no, no hurt, no pain, no disease, no suffering. There is none of that in your kingdom. And so God, I pray for every soul, whether they're in person or whether they've joined us online. And I pray, God, that if they don't know you, you would begin to draw them if they do know you, but God, somehow they've lost the vision or the, the focus of until. That God, today you would bring it back to their remembrance, that you would clear that focus, that they would have a vision beyond their current circumstance. And God, for those of them who are waiting for the until, but maybe they've gotten a little tired. The world has beat them up and beat them down. I pray that you would renew their strength, that you would renew their focus, that you would renew the energy in them to continue to wait, to continue to persevere in following you and living for your kingdom until. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we just release your spirit to, to do whatever you choose to do in these next few moments. Convict those that need conviction. Draw those that need drawing, God. Encourage those who need encouraged. Strengthen those who need strength, O oh God. But as we respond to you today, O oh God, I pray that you would have your way.